Jesus' name, amen. All right, so I can't really see the screen from here in any direction because I'm surrounded by a living room. Oh, yeah, that one. Oh, good. You guys are smart. All right. <laughs> um, so I am going to do a reboot. Uh, those who came to the men's day, it wasn't quite a men's retreat, but a men's day, I gave a talk on adversity, which came out of a, uh, a weekend or a long weekend that my wife and I did up in New Hampshire with a teacher that talked about the adversities that come upon us in life. And so for basically two full days, maybe more than that, um, we got sort of the download on that. So I've, I've cobbled together that, those notes, put them together, retooled it. So even if you heard it from me before, this is going to be better. And uh, for those that weren't at that, then uh, you'll get to hear this for the first time. So looking forward to uh, opening this up for you guys. So uh, let's see. So we're going to start with a couple of things. Um, one is, well, two premises that you see ahead of you. So premise number one, we'll hear that one. Okay. So God created the perfection or the perfect relationship with us. But we chose sin and sin entered the relationship between us and God, and now we have a choice. So just understanding that this is sort of the baseline that we start at, right? We know that God wants relationship with us. We know that he set out a world with Adam and Eve, and there was going to be this great relationship. But we, not just Adam or Eve or blame it on somebody else, but We've all chosen sin at some level. So even if we put ourselves back in that garden, in that perfect relationship, we know we weren't going to keep it together. So when I say we here in this, um, we chose sin, we have chosen sin, right? We broke the relationship with God. And so we know that Christ repaired that relationship, but we have a choice whether we're going to walk in a broken relationship with God due to our own inequities, or if we're going to walk in the promised relationship that God has for us through Jesus Christ. So that's the first premise that we're going to hold on to. Second premise, we all have adversities, and it comes in five flavors. Now, anybody here think that there's no such thing as adversities? You've had an amazing life, no bumps, no problems, no issues. Anybody? Everybody's hands up. This is amazing. If you're watching from home, everyone here has never had any problems in their life, and they are just flying high. They can't imagine there'd ever be a problem. Well, I don't have to convince anyone that you have some adversity, right? Some trial, some problem, something. And, you know, I've always thought, and maybe you do too, you sort of have the big, the big problem that's in front of you today. And if I have you all think about what's coming up that you're bummed out about, that you're struggling with, that you're, is on your mind, everybody here is going to have one, right? So in, in my mind, and maybe yours too, we sort of think, once I get through this thing, then everything's going to be okay, right? All I need to do is just suck it up and get through this thing, and then life's going to be great. I'll have no more trials, right? This is the last one, right? Is that true? Once you get through one trial, there's another one coming over the horizon right after you. And then after that one, there's another one. If you look back on your whole life, that's sort of how it's been. God actually has a life and a world situation. We have it where the trials don't really stop coming. Now, Everybody's got their different threshold of what a trial is, right? You got some kid that returned back from war and has seen things that we'll never see. And when they stub their toe getting out of their car, it's not that much of a trial, right? Because they've just seen something crazy. And so that means nothing or not as much. But then you got folks that haven't done any of that and they stub their toe and it's broken. They can't walk for two weeks and... It's the end of the world. It's the worst thing that's ever happened to him. So we all have tolerances about what that is. And I'm, I don't think any of us are saying we're at the top or the bottom, but we all know there's trouble from whatever stripe that is. So what I found helpful about the, the, 
the material that I'm going to be presenting is that when you have a plan, it makes getting through things a lot easier. And God presents us a plan throughout the Bible, and, and I'm just going to present that to you so that you have a plan. Because other than that, we have our Sunday morning stuff and prayer and worship and hearing different things. Um, dispensationalism, you know, the whole thing. Sorry, a little jab there. Um, we've got dispensationalism to help us through our problems. No. Uh, so we have these, these things that we do as people, as Christians, whatever. But then every time a trial comes, it's like the first one and we're back on our heels. And oh, oh me, oh my. So, uh, I found that having this spelled out very systematically, we can take on the trials that are coming, right? Even if you're not in a bad one right now, there's one coming. It's coming. In fact, we all know that, you know, Paul constantly talks about how trials produce perseverance and perseverance produces character. And then that produces an even stronger relationship with God. And if we look back on our lives, the rocky parts, the, the valleys, the problems have usually driven us back to a close relationship with God and actually grown us up. We all think of that friend that we had in school that never had any problems, right? And everything was handed to them on the golden or a silver spoon or whatever it is. You know, they had it all. It was really easy for them. Was that the person we wanted to hang out with all the time? You know, we'd say they're stuck up or they're, you know, they're, they don't get it. They don't understand. They don't have compassion for others. No, it was the trials of life that sort of got us to be more compassionate. So we all know inherently that although we don't like going through it, we know that trials actually produce something much stronger than if we had this easy life that had no issues whatsoever. So... Thank God for the for the trials that come. Okay, so let's let's just quickly, and I, this doesn't have to take a long time, but I think it would be good to just if we started to categorize the type of adversities that come. So here we go. First one, frustrations. Anyone been frustrated behind the wheel of a car? Oh wow, now we got lots of hands up. Okay, and we've been frustrated with people, right? Things that pet peeves, right? Things that annoy you. I'm sure that's never happened within your family structure. Nothing's ever gotten you frustrated within parenting or having parents or being a teenager or being around a teenager. Frustrations come in all types, right? And that's maybe one level of adversity where you're just like consumed with emotions because of problems that are coming up or adversities or trials. So that's one. Second one, life difficulties. So this is get a little thicker and probably more uh, applicable to, to most people is that you have problems in life, right? We wouldn't say that maybe someone cutting you off is a, is a life difficulty. That's probably more frustration. But life difficulties are when you have a plan and that plan doesn't go right. You know, you hear about some issue with, with something, maybe it's some change in the, you know, politics that's affecting you, um, you name it. There's life difficulties probably, probably capture most of the adversities that come our way. And, and maybe, you know, I had you guys thinking about things that are adversities in your own life. And uh, when you think about that thing that's ahead of you, my guess is it's probably life difficulties uh, throwing you a curveball when you weren't ready for it. Let's go to number three here. Anybody have adversities in relationships? You don't have to raise your hand, but yeah. Everybody does, right? Relationships are hard. We're, we want our own way and they want their own way and eventually it's going to rub, whether it be marital dynamics, whether it be your boss, whether it be your employees, whether it be family, um, parents, raising children, They're, the adversities come a mile a minute when it comes to dealing with other human beings because we're all coming at it from a different point of view and we all have our own uh, 
take on it, and we, that usually eventually rubs the wrong way around almost everybody that we get to know. So we are expected, and it's fairly straightforward to have relationship adversities, health issues, right? Everything's going great, and then it isn't. Um, I had a pretty bad mountain bike accident uh, right at the end of the summer, Labor Day weekend, and I'm still not back. I mean, broken bones and everything screwed up over there. And for someone who really enjoys athletic pursuits and any of any type, I even enjoy just reaching up or washing my hair. All those things I couldn't do all of a sudden, right? Well, not this side. Um, so, you know, we, we have, and, and that, that's a pretty, you know, I know, probably all of us have gone through some sort of health, health issues over our lives. And so this is a fairly, I'm grateful, fairly simple one for me. But uh, when you get that tough news, when the accident comes or the disease comes or the thing comes and you are in bad straits or, or maybe it happens to somebody else that you're near and dear to, uh, health issues are definitely an adversity. And then there's the surprise, right? There's the just random chaos that comes in life that we're not expecting and it throws us off our game and we're just, we're out of it. All right, so those are the five types of adversities. And I think if you are thinking of an adversity in your life or one that you've been through, you're gonna categorize it into one of those things. Okay, so what causes these things from a biblical standpoint? Let's get into that. All right, so a general or common adversity. Um, so this is something that the Bible talks about is, happens to everyone, right? It's not just you. Could be a political thing, could be raining, could be, you know, if you're in a, in a farming community and there's a drought, that's happening to everyone. These are things that happen to all people all the time. So you can't say, God, this has just happened to me. You look around you and you say, everybody is being affected by this. COVID, right? That's a general adversity. It happening, happening to our entire society. You're not singled out in any way. Number two, a test of faith or a trial. So we hear about this in the Bible quite a bit because we see it from that perspective. The Bible gives us a clue that Job's being tested or Abraham's being tested and uh, let's see how these guys do during this scenario. Those things can happen to us as well. So these are why adversities come. So a test of faith is definitely something where God's just checking you out, seeing how much you have, growing you in that way by putting you in a situation that's going to test whether you're just saying it or whether you're all in on it. Okay, number three, pruning. Anybody here gardeners or take care of plants and, and things like that? So we've got these bushes in our backyard that um, are like a box hedge and they're meant to screen out our neighbors. But these, we don't pay attention to them that much and we don't prune them that much. So they grow really fast and really tall, but really thin. And they grow tall, but then right where our neighbors are is all thin. So they never really work that well. And we've let them go so far that now all the thick stuff is up above and we're staring at our neighbors through the thin part at the bottom. And then I go to the front of the house where all the neighbors trim their box edges, including us, much more. They're nice and dense. You can't see through them. They're all like full. It's because we didn't prune at the right time. We just let them grow wildly and... And now they're not doing what they were meant to do. They're not these, and even the, even the leaves grow smaller because they're sort of used to getting beat up or cut off. So they grow these smaller, tighter leaves. And in the backyard, the same exact plant, big leaves, big everything, because we rarely cut them. And now they're really tall and not worth, not worth it for us. In fact, we're, you know, pretty much the only way to deal with them is to tear them out completely and try to do it again, but now keep an eye on them and prune them. Same thing happens with fruit, right? In uh, the story of the vineyard, um, the, you know, the, the, the vine dresser in and, and John 15 you know, talks about that the, the caretaker has to prune the, the, the branches that are not producing fruit, right? So he goes around, looks at this grape, uh, grape vine, and sees that 
you know, these three branches producing tons of grapes, but these two producing nothing. You just got to cut it off, right? And by cutting it off, the more nutrients goes to other ones and grows new branches that will produce more fruit. And anybody who's been around plants at all can understand this concept that God is trimming things off of us. And so we say, well, we're going to get into how to deal with all of these, but, um, and how God's working in them. So I just want to bring up the concept of that God is treating us like a plant where there are times when he's going to trim things off us, not a pleasant experience at all, but for our own good. And, uh, we'll hear about that a lot. You know, one of the, um, one of the words that's I hear a lot recently is margin, right? That your life doesn't have much margin in it. And I, you know, with two young kids at home and a, and a, and a business and a wife and all these things going on in my life, my mom and my wife are saying, what about your margin? Like, you know, you got so much packed into every day that there's, you don't have time to be calm and time to, you know, recharge. And uh, clearly that's a biblical lesson that I could use a lot more of. But margin is part of pruning. Like sometimes, and I would say even crashing with my shoulder here, I had to spend a lot of time laying on a couch for a while, which drove me bananas. But it forced me, you know, that verse makes me lie down in green pastures. Well, I had a makes me lie down on a brown couch for a long time. And, you know, trying to like show me that, your life doesn't have to be jammed with things all the time and that actually some downtime, some rest can actually grow you closer to God and give you a nice perspective on life. All right. Number four, selfishness. Dang, I hate this one. Um, you know, most of, most of our life, most of our trials, I shouldn't say most, but a lot of them, we can r trace back to our own selfishness. We want what we want when we want it, right? And it, we try to grow out of it, but it still comes back, almost like that two-year-old in us is saying, I want the cookie now. I want it before I eat my dinner. I want that toy now, even though it's my friends. I want it now. We want things now. And when we don't get it, we are not happy. And we make everyone else's life miserable until we get it or something close to that. So selfishness is like that pride aspect of us that is really hard to quell and that we need to really pay attention to because selfishness is a lot of the time what is driving the adversities in our life because if we backed off, if we saw from God's perspective, um, a lot of the adversity would fall away when it's not about us. And then attacks of the enemy. So. We know that through scripture that there's f forces against us. I don't think anyone could take clear stock of society and history and say, everything's been going great. We, there's been no problems. We look over a couple world wars and issues, you know, open up your headlines of the day and read them all and say, yeah, things are going great. Don't see any problems at all. No. It's like, especially with the 24-hour news cycle, we know of every problem that's happened to anyone, anywhere, immediately. It's on our phone, in our face. So we've got this idea. There is, we know for a fact that there are problems that are driven that are not of God, and they are coming at us. And if we're not ready for them, or if we bury our head in the sand or say, oh, that's not real, da, 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 we're just opening ourselves for more attacks in that way. Now, is that the last one, or is there a six? Okay. All right, let's go to the next slide. All right, so let's hit the next button. Okay, so this is how to deal with uh, the different adversities that come. Um, and so we've covered them all. We talked about general adversities that are happening to everyone. And this is the how-to. What do you do? All right, Spence, we, we got you. There is adversities. You've listed them. Now what do we do, right? This is the part that I love about Christianity. It doesn't just pose the problem and then walk away. This is what to do about the problems in life. This is why the Bible is so alive, so powerful, so applicable to the things in your life day to day is that there are 
key components in it that say, hey, here's how it goes. And guess what? We didn't just test these out last week. This is stuff, mankind, you know, 4,000, 2,000 years of testing these theories out and they work every time. So what do we do about general adversity in our life? So if you're thinking back of your favorite adversity that you're facing now, and, and maybe it's general, maybe it was some, one of those other ones, but um, so here, here's what the plan of attack is. Stay in peace and follow the Father's wisdom. There's a number of verses that I have, but I tried to pick the one that would be the strongest or the most uh, applicable. But uh, we, we read in John 16, 33, I have told you these things so that you, uh, so that in me you may have peace. In this world you will have trouble, but take heart, I have overcome the world. So he's promising that we're going to have trouble. That doesn't sound like a great glorious God who promises you you're going to have trouble. You imagine you've got like a two-year-old in your arms, you're rocking him to sleep, and you say, I promise you're going to have trouble. Like what, what sort of father says to their kid, you're going to have a lot of trouble. Well, look at that right in the middle of this verse. In this world, you will have trouble. So God agrees with us that things aren't going to go the way we want it all the time. Sometimes for our own pruning and good, and sometimes just not fair, and it's coming at you. It doesn't really matter. It's coming one way or the other. But take heart, I have overcome the world. So God's basically saying to us, I have this Bible for you so that you may have peace in this world that you're going to have troubles in. So that we are called to be in peace even though we got trouble on the, on the horizon. And so we need to realize that the reason we have peace isn't because we psych ourselves into it or because, well, I've made it through this stuff before or any of those things on our own volition. The power in this verse comes from the last, last part of it. But take heart, I have overcome the world. God wins. God is on your side. God wants the best of you. God wants to be glorified in this situation. God wants you to tell this story when it's all over where he's the hero. Not you, not somebody else, not the circumstances. God's the hero in this story. And if you think about your life and the crazy stuff that's happened to you, good and bad, I bet you you can go back and say, that was crazy terrible. But man, look how it worked out. Man, look at what I walked away with. Man, look at the things that I now have as a character about me or a sensitivity to other people because I went through that hard time at that time. So that's, that's the first one. General, general um, problems, we need to just stay true to where God is knowing that he wins in the end. Because we don't win in the end if you take the other side of it. All right, test of faith. So, <clears throat> test of faith. You think of um, the story of Job, Abraham. These guys were just put through some monster problems. And maybe we've had a few of those problems. Those guys had it, like, all at once, all the time. And, uh, you know, you, you see that story play out, and, and God and, and them get blessed, uh, you know, tenfold. And so... Let's just read this verse in James about what to do when you're in a test of faith. And maybe sometimes during adversity, it's hard to categorize them quite right. But I think all of these work together, so you don't have to necessarily categorize them. Or maybe you just have a feeling, man. I just feel like I'm getting tested right now for my faith. Uh, James 1, uh, 2 through 5. My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God, who gives it all, gives it, gives to all liberally and without reproach, and it will be given to him. Bunch of cool stuff in this passage um, that when we're waiting and we're being tested for our faith, that that produces patience. There's really no way to fake yourself into patience, right? Some people are more patient than others, but it's probably because they practiced it more. They had more opportunities to apply patience to their life. It wasn't like, 
they just, you know, drank some concoction and suddenly had patience, right? It's, it's, it's because of their life and their character has produced patience in their life. So that's pretty straightforward. And if you say, if you're someone who says, oh, I'm, I'm impatient or I'm stubborn or I'm whatever, well, that means there's some more testing of faith coming your way. So be careful when you label yourself as a character issue. Oh, I'm just a stubborn person or, oh, I don't have patience like you do. Uh, I would be careful about just throwing that out there. I would actually say I need to learn patience in this situation because we, we become what we are intentional about being in that way. So patience fits into that category. Um, but let patience have its perfect work that you may be perfect and complete, lacking nothing. So a lot of times when we have adversity, we feel like we're lacking something, right? There's some problem that's on the horizon that's going to affect us negatively or it wouldn't be an adversity. So when we're feeling perfect and complete and lacking in nothing, that is going right after the trial and saying, I'm perfect and complete because I have patience in God, not my circumstances. Um, if any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask of God who gives it all liberally. So when you're in these situations and God is waiting for us to say, I can't do it on my own, right? He's putting us in a situation daily, weekly, monthly, year to year, where we have to say, I can't control this. This is not me. I can't pull this lever, say this thing, write this letter, hire a lawyer, scream at somebody. I can't fix this situation. That's where God's waiting for us to get to. That's actually a positive thing. It seems like the last straw, but the reality is God is asking us to say, I can't do it without you. And the quicker we get there, the quicker God steps in. So the more we can say, I don't know what I'm gonna do. I need your wisdom. If anyone you lacks wisdom, let him ask in God who gives it liberally. liberally. Our job is to say, I can't do it on my own. I need you and I need your wisdom. So that's a great one when you're falling into a test of faith or actually any of these is to say, it's not me, it's you. I need your wisdom, not my own. So the faster we can get there, the better. And you can keep saying you're stubborn. You can keep saying um, you got all the answers and you're going to work through this and you're going to press persevere on your own might. It's just a dead end street. You're eventually... Look, you're going to extend the adversity, extend the trial even longer, and then be in a place where you eventually do fall on your face and have to cry out to God in that way. He's waiting for that. So it's not an act of us being weak or not good enough. That's what God wants us right away. All right, next third one. Let's hit that button again. Pruning. All right, we talked about this. So pruning, what do we do when we're in a pruning situation? God is like nipping things off of us. He's taking things off of our plate that we thought were fruitful and we thought we were doing the right thing and God's closing doors. We want to go this way. God slams the door shut. We go this way, the door slams shut. Those are all pruning opportunities. I say opportunities or adversities that come our way. Let's, let's read a verse in Hebrews here. Now may the God of peace who brought... Um, again, who brought again from the dead, our Lord Jesus to the great shepherd of the sheep by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do, that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. So when we're, when we're in a pruning scenario, um, it's not to fight God. Once we realize that God is closing doors and opening doors in ways that we weren't really ready for, instead of fighting it, instead of complaining, instead of saying, but I thought that door was the one I was supposed to go through. I thought that was the situation I was, God, I, I just knew that I was supposed to go on this trip to Africa and you've shut the door to that. That doesn't make any sense. Even when they're good intention things, when God shuts the door, cooperate. Look for your ability to say, it's not mine, God. You're directing me. I think of, you know, and it's uh, kind of raining just a little bit. You haven't turned your white windshield wipers on, and that water falls, sort of pools up into like little bit puddles, if you will, and then all of a sudden it starts like just running down really quickly. 
kind of runs around other things. Like watching that water find the fastest way down, just it, it goes a little left, a little right, kind of goes through all those things. That's what I think God wants for us when we're in these situations. Well, we are not holding on to every little decision, every little thing that God's pointing us in. When we hit a when we hit a brick wall, when we get a no, when we get a closed door, we're saying, "God, what is the next step? I can't wait to see what you're about to do with me." I don't know if any of you guys are skiers. I skied uh, most of my life, and I had these great these cousins that grew up on the mountains from when they were two years old. And if you don't know what a mogul field is, a mogul field is um, a series of bumps that form on a ski trail because people are all turning and everyone kind of turns similarly. And after a while, a bunch of loose snow piles up and, and, and then there's hard snow between them. And if that goes on for days and days of hundreds of people skiing on the same thing, it creates this just field of bumps. Some bumps can be this tall. And they're all been skied over and they're all, they kind of get hard and hard. Well, you can imagine if you're skiing down what you see in the movies or whatever, these wide open fields, that's fine if it's being groomed every time. But the reality is if you're going really fast and suddenly you hit this just field of bumps everywhere, man, your skis could shoot this way. One ski goes on this side of the other ski. You just wipe out immediately. It's like crazy hard. And as someone who skied my whole life, I... I kind of, you know, get a little nervous when there's a bunch of bumps everywhere and I'm going really fast and it's icy and it's, you know, I'm just going to get thrown like a buck and bronco. So I go skiing with my uh, cousins who I have never seen, seen them ski a mogul field and I make my way through it. I'm, I'm kind of down in a little posture. I'm barely keeping it together and I finally get down, sort of proud of myself that I made it through this mogul field. And I turn up and I watch my cousin who's, four years younger than me and you know somewhere around high school that's you know big deal he's he's a freshman i'm a senior that kind of stuff like oh man this kid's gonna get wrecked and i watch him go down this mogul field and it looks like that that bead of water on your windshield and he just goes right down the middle no problem he just takes each one his body's staying nice and still his legs are moving a thousand miles an hour he's going right between all of them as if he had done that a thousand times and I'm like, you know, I was going through, I had poles in the air and I was leaning back and it was a mess. And I just think, isn't that, just watching him do it and think, it looks like water just running through the middle of that mogul field. And I just think that's what God has for us. Instead of seeing each one of those bumps as like the end of the world and, oh God, I didn't, I didn't think you wanted me to go this way. Oh, you want to go this way. God's saying, just come with me. I'm going right down the middle. I'm going to make this look beautiful in the midst of chaos which is a mogul field, which is your life, right? Our lives are kind of chaotic. We don't know what's coming tomorrow. We don't know what happened. We don't know why it's like this. We don't, can't make sense of it. You never can make sense of it. It always makes a lot more sense when you look back on it. You think, oh, that's why my family grew up without much money. Now I understand why I was like that. Now I understand why my parents didn't let me, you know, go in the house of the kid two, down, two doors down the street. But when I was a kid, I really wanted to go in that kid's house. That kind of stuff, we look back and we, it all starts making sense. So we need to say, God, I am fluid. I am going to cooperate when you're pruning me, when you're taking things away, when things don't seem fair. I'm going to be with you. So I just wanted to go over this again. This is something from a couple times ago that I spoke about. Um, again, from the same guy that we did this uh, retreat with, um, just to remind us, because I think of this thing all the time, and it was last February, so it hasn't even been a full year, but this John 15 analogy holds so much resource in my life, and I've read that first so many times, being a Christian since I was a little kid, and then now it makes so much sense. It's amazing how God just opens up your eyes to these things. Jesus is the vine. He's what's growing the tree. He's what's growing everything. He's the one that's taking the nutrients out of the ground through the roots and bringing them up. We are the branch, it says in John 15. We're the branch. We're just that horizontal little guy that's out there with the grapes growing on it. Certainly we have some leaves. Certainly there's some nutrition that's running through us. But that branch does nothing without the vine, right? That branch falls off, even maybe because too much fruit, whatever. 
that branch falls off or it doesn't produce fruit, um, if it's not connected to the vine in the right way, there's nothing happening. And the Holy Spirit sort of infused through the roots all the way through to the fruit. He produces the fruit in us. We're not, our job is not to create fruit. And we say fruit in sort of a Christian uh, world. It means the good things in life, the blessings of life. Whatever that means to you, that can mean a whole bunch of different things, but it means the good things. Are you producing fruit means are you manifesting good things in a Christian way? Are you, are you doing things of God and are, those are producing positive reinforcements in your life or in the lives of others? That's fruit. And we think we should be producing fruit. No, our job is just to be connected to the vine, right? The vines where all the power is, the vines, Jesus, the vines flowing through that nutrients so that we are producing fruit by the Holy Spirit, not us, not us. And then in a bigger picture of this, who's, who's making sure the foxes don't come? Who's making sure the birds don't come? Who's making sure that there's water when it's a dry season? Or I was just talking to a, a client who's growing a vineyard and they're talking about too much water is a problem for vineyards if, in New England. Unlike Sonoma, California, they, they're worried that sometimes they're going to get too much water and they're not. They're going to over soak everything and it won't grow the way it should. So there's a lot of things that the vine dresser, God, in this analogy, is protecting for us. But we think we're in charge of all the all the circumstances. Turns out, no, in this in John 15, it says God's in charge of the circumstances. Our job is to be connected to Jesus. That's it. So when we're thinking, oh, no, well, this adversity is gone. This is the worst. I can't believe it. Please pray for me. This da, 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 da. Oh, We're all in a panic. Just look to this verse, John 15. Your job is to be connected to Jesus. Everything else is God's. Everything else is God. What a great what, weight off your shoulders, right? Because we get concerned, well, I got to control this and I got to control this. And what if it doesn't rain? What if this bad thing happened? What if I lose my job? And blah, 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 blah. Nope. It's all our job is to be connected to Jesus. All right, let's go to four. Selfishness, our favorite one that we all don't want to talk about, but is always just floating underneath the surface. What if the adversities that we're facing are because of our selfishness? And my guess is a lot of them come to that because when we can get our heart with God, the selfishness can go away because it's not about us anymore. And the more it's about you, the, the world, the culture, advertising, everybody says it's about you. I love hearing that, right? Almost every commercial, you deserve it. You deserve this shampoo. Really? You deserve a new Lexus. You deserve this and that. Our world is constantly telling us we deserve this. You have the right. You have the, you deserve, you deserve, you deserve. It's hard not to get close to media or talk to anyone and not have that underscored all the time. You deserve it. You deserve it. It's your right. The reality is that that is feeding our selfish desires that we, we are, we do deserve that. I, I definitely have to, I'm not going to be happy unless I have a brand new Lexus, right? Those types of things are, are being thrown at us constantly to the point that we can't distinguish between the two. God's word is, is way above all of that. And it says, no, selfishness is the problem. You don't deserve any of it. You're, it is not okay that you are the center of it all. God's the center of it all. And the more we can give them that, the freer we become. It actually works opposite. The more joy you get out of life is when you stop saying, yeah, I got to have this. It's my right. It's my, I deserve it. I deserve it. Romans 8, 5 through 8, classic verse. Those who live according to the flesh have their minds set on what the flesh desires. But those who live in accordance with the spirit have their minds set on what the spirit desires. The mind governed by the flesh is death, but the mind governed by the spirit is life and peace. The mind governed by the flesh is hostile to God. It does not submit to God's law, nor can it do so. Those who are in the realm of the flesh cannot please God. All right. So, um, 
the, the guy we were talking to sort of had this phrase. He said, are you in the kingdom? Meaning, are you acting and thinking like a Christian or like the world? And I bet you, and I'm guilty as charged, there's plenty of times when I get into the flesh and not in the kingdom. But the more you can start realizing and watching yourself, am I in the kingdom on this or am I in my own flesh? It's going to change the entire paradigm of what you're dealing with. Because when you're in the kingdom, your mind is set on things of the spirit that has life attached to it. And we all know that our selfish desires that we want to just feed ourselves, be it material things or I want to feel better. I want to, I want to have this relationship work out so that I feel better. And I want, I want this to happen. So I feel better. Everything's about feelings and me and me first, like that two year old that's just creeping below the surface. But the things of the spirit are about me saying, I don't, I don't have it together. I'm a mess. I can't get, I can't take care of it at all. I need you God to take care of me in this situation. I have run out of all answers. That's where God wants us. Believe it or not, that's where God wants us. So this verse is huge. And uh, if you can, when you're in those selfish moments, you, I say you, me, when, when we're in that, when we're in these selfish moments, man, Romans 8, 8 is just like on top of it. it just kind of cuts through all the nonsense that's got floating around our, our minds about why we're important and why I want this and meh, 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 stomping around like a two-year-old. Enough of that. We got to start saying, it's not about me. It's about you, Lord. All right, next one. Attacks of the enemy. I have two slides on this. So uh, one is to say, is there an enemy? What are you talking about, Spence? What do you mean? I don't, I don't understand. This. I don't think I believe in the devil. I don't think I believe in these, these negative aspects. Again, flick on any news channel and see if you don't see some sort of evil undertone to what's going on in today's world. But you don't have to have today. Just scroll back a month, a year, a decade. Go to World War II. Pretty crazy then, too. So be alert and sober-minded. Your enemy is the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion looking for someone to devour. If we're not aware that there's, we're, there's teams and there's another team out there that doesn't want the best for us. If we're unaware of that and want to stick our head in the sand about it, do so at your own peril. Everybody's motivated by, um, you know, fear and love. Those are the two main motivations, right? So this is the fear side of it. Like, it's real. It's on. It's a real enemy that's out there. And, and your choices have consequences in that realm. So just want to lay that up, that that's the real deal, and you should be uh, aware of it and be, be on it and be um, alert. Next slide. Same, same attacks of the enemy. So this is a great verse in Ephesians 6, 10 through 12. That really, I don't know, it was the best verse I could find or verses that um, kind of took this whole... What do we do when we're being attacked and we feel like we're being attacked? And of course, it's usually through other people or situations or we just feel like, I just cannot catch a break. I am all in on God and it is not going well. Why is that? Why is that? Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God and you can look that up. That's its own set of verses. Um, about the different things that you can do to put on the armor of God every day or in the midst of a battle, that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, blood, but against the rulers and authorities, against the cosmic powers over the present darkness, uh, over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. So when you're in a situation that isn't going your way, right? The adversity thing. Maybe that's a relationship. Maybe that's a, um, a bunch of bad news. Maybe it's a circumstance in your life. If you can take that out of the, it's this person's fault or it's this situation's fault and say, this is about me being closer to God and me putting on the armor of him to resist the negative evil influences that are happening around me. 
suddenly it takes the pressure off you, which is kind of wonderful when we don't want to just be huddled down trying to make it happen or just be defeated completely, is to say, I'm wrestling uh, not against flesh and blood, but against these cosmic powers. And the good news is that God wins. God beats the evilness every single time. Every example in the Bible, every example that we can think of in our own lives, amazing that God wins every single time, and yet we don't rest in that authority and that provision that happens. So pretty amazing. All right, next slide. All right, steps that you can take, and then we're going to wrap it up. I have two, two last slides that are going to be quick. If you can take a picture with your phone or whatever, I'm not going to read through each one, but I just think the more we can apply Scripture to our lives the better off we are. Because if left to our own devices, well, I think I should do this. Well, I think I should do that. You're, you're going without a net because you don't know what happens in the future. I don't know what happens in the future. God knows what happens in the future. And he wrote it down in the Bible for us to apply to the future. That's what's so incredible about this. What steps can you take to guard your heart? So this is against all um, adversities, right? What are you doing daily to make sure that you have the resources to win when you're in a trial. And you can't just throw this stuff on it right when it happens. That's what we just covered, what to do when it happens. This is stuff to do prescriptively, right? You don't uh, just walk out of your house one day and say, I think I'm gonna run a marathon today. No training, no shoes, I'm not even ready. I'm just gonna start running, maybe 26 miles later, I'll figure out if I was prepared or not. That would be insane, right? So you're doing things ahead of time to get ready for that. You're buying the shoes, you're doing the little runs, you're doing the bigger runs, you're talking to people, you're on websites, you're getting ready, you're eating the right stuff, you're figuring out what to drink, studying your body, so that you could say, 26.2 miles, let's go do it. That's what we're talking about now, the training part of life. Like, what are you doing now so that you can ride the storm out and be right there with God? All right, number one, walk with God at all times. What are you clinging to? Remember the vine analogy in uh, John 15? Are you clinging to God or are you clinging to the world? That verse in Matthew talks about what, which one are you doing? Are you clinging to the world? Are you trying to make the world make sense? Are you trying to make the world's resources apply to your problems? They don't work. I think everyone knows that inherently. I know it from the random things that have happened to me. It's always God. It's never the world that solves those issues. And by the world, we mean what the world has to offer, sin. world has to offer sin. world has to have, off, offer self-reliance and material things. We know we're not capable, right? You can puff yourself up and say how good you are and I'm wise and I did it. We're, we all fall. We all stumble all the time. The Christian life isn't about the Christian being perfect, it's about God being perfect and us aligning ourselves with him. That's the main, that's the main verse. All right. Stay in peace. All right. Are you in the kingdom? Romans 14, 17. So that's where that, that verse comes from. Are you checking yourself every day? Hmm. I feel a little off today. Hmm. I feel like I'm, I'm kind of worked up. I'm worried. I'm, I'm not feeling right. I'm not, eyes aren't clear. Are you in the kingdom? My guess is I know the answer to that because when we're full of worry and fear and doubt, it's usually because we've slipped into our putting it on ourselves and not on God. Because as soon as it goes to God, we know he's the champ. He's not, he's not losing. He's going to fortify us. He's going to take care of us. Stay in peace. Number three, seek wisdom. There's a verse earlier that said, if you're in a place where you don't know what to do, ask God. Right? We just read that verse a few minutes ago. When you're going to seek wisdom, ask God. Let it pass. So if you look back on your life and say, you know, I was in a really tough scrape. And if you look back and say, was I in the kingdom on that or was I not? Just if you look back on your life and say, I was in a really tough spot and I could not figure out how to get through it. You, we usually look back at ourselves and like, I was an idiot during that time. I was freaking out. I was in worry. I wasn't sleeping at night. I was just in a, just a bad way. You weren't in the kingdom, right? The kingdom is in a peaceful way that you're actually charged up. 
you're taking this on, you know what's coming, you know who wins, and you've got a light in your eye and your head up so that people around you are like, are you sure you know what's going on here? You don't, you seem too peaceful to be going through this hard of a situation. And I've seen that around me, solid Christian men and women who have gone through horrendous things in their life, and they were such a, such a beacon of light for the rest of the people around them. Christians and non-Christians, everyone's just shaking their head like, this is how you do it. This is how you go through the tough stuff. And so we want to be that for other people, not for our own self-reliance, but to say, this is what God wants for me, and it's also a great example for others. So let it pass, because he's in charge, he wins. John 14, 27. And then don't lose your joy, because he is our rock. If you guys haven't been in Isaiah recently, I kind of threw the way I sort of chain reference through the Bible. It seems like every verse ends in Isaiah, if you chase verses through the Bible with chain referencing. And um, Isaiah's got some meaty, awesome stuff. It is just like one rock star verse after another. And so Isaiah 26, 3 through 4 is a great example of that, that our joy is important. So when you're in the midst of it, you got to look for where is your joy coming from? If it's coming from your circumstances, if it's coming from you, you're going to lose your joy all the time. When your joy is in something eternal, like the rock of Christ, we can go through anything because your joy isn't about your circumstances. Your joy isn't about how awesome you are. Your joy isn't about how awesome God is. And the last one, after we wait on him, he will show us why. So isn't it wild how we look at past problems in our life and then see how it shaped us to the people we are today, changed things, take, took people out of our lives, brought people into our lives, made us more um, soft for people who were going through a similar situation, showed us peace and patience and, and, and uh, bro broke our heart a little bit so that we could be a softer person to other people. I mean, after all of that, he shows us why. That's in Isaiah 3, 18 through 22. And uh, so let's pause for a second. If you want to take a picture of this, read those verses. You'll see what I have to do, uh, why I brought those verses up. Um, and then lastly, okay, this is about relationships. We, we sort of glossed over that one, but there's a few things that I want you to think about. If, if you're in a situation or guaranteed you will be in a situation where you have relationship issues with somebody, maybe, maybe close by, maybe someone at work, maybe a distant friend, but we all rub shoulders with all sorts of people and eventually there's gonna be some fire there. And so here, here's, um, here's some tips biblically about what to do with that um, on relationship healing. Repent and ready to follow. Part of being in a Christian life is not subjecting your will and saying, God, I want you to do this in that person's life. I want you to do this in this situation. That's not neutral. We want to be in neutral with God. When we're praying, we're in neutral. We are saying, God, I don't know what you're going to do with this thing, but I'm along for the ride and it's going to be wild. Let's see what happens. So we want to repent of what we've brought to the table and say, there's always something we brought to the table, by the way. It's never a one-sided street. Whether it's uh, reacting emotionally, whether it's saying things that we thought were right, but the other person misinterpreted as wrong, we can own all that. And repenting is part of that. And ready to follow God in neutral. Give it to God. It's not ours to figure out. We can't control other people. We can barely control our own actions. We need to say, Lord, this is, this is you. I'm giving it completely to you. I'm not going to try to be in the midst of it. I'm not going to try to scheme my way through this thing. Lord, this thing's totally yours. Because when he is victorious in it, we then give it to him. Instead of like, I sorted that person out. I told them how I felt, and then they, they, they came to see the light. That's never how it works. Number three, it's how it works in our brain. I'm going to tell them, and then they're going to be straightened out. Never works that way. We think it is. It feels good. Like, yeah, I'm going to straighten. It never works because they just get more upset, and then <laughs> the distance is more divided. It's the opposite of what we think is going to happen. That's our sin driving in. The issue is, the issue is not yours to deal with, so... It's yours to deal with your side of the equation and, and doing whatever it is you can do to make it right. But it is not to solve the other person's issue. We are not in the game of growing up other adults, right? 
If you have kids, you may be in the game of raising them, but that's it. Other people, you're not teaching anybody a lesson, ever. It never works. We all think we're going to. I'm going to teach them. I'm going to show them. <laughs> never works. It's always... It always leads to more divide, and they get more stubborn in their ways, and you get more stubborn in your ways. just continues to keep that battle. So we're giving it to God. Uh, the issue is not yours to deal with. Walk, walk through the healing. Understand that when you've been through a tough scrape with someone, and you've handled it biblically, and you've given it to God, and you, all these things we just talked about, is that your relationship will be better. doesn't sound possible. But when you've been through a hard time with someone and you've come out the other side, you have a stronger relationship because of it. Relationships when it's sunny out and everybody's getting the news they want and you're high-fiving, sure, you grow in friendship, you grow in relationship during those situations, but you really grow when you go through tough times together. And sometimes those tough times are the relationships that happen. So understand that walking through the healing actually produces a stronger relationship in the end with you and also you with God. Last one. I think it's the last one. Expect God's healing power. I think a lot of times we're so nervous, we're so worried that we show our disbelief in God, that he can actually handle this situation. So just praying that uh, we can see that in, in our scenario with our relationship with others as well, that, um, oh, we got one more, <laughs> that we, uh, we expect God to heal. And not say, God, I don't know what you're going to do here. This is never going to work. This person's a complete idiot. I don't want to even talk to them anymore. I just, da, 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 da. We've all thought or said those words. If we're expecting healing from God, it changes our heart completely. Because we're not throwing that person under the bus, even though we want to wring their neck. We want to say, God, you're going to somehow work this out. I have no idea. I can't wait to see what's going to happen here. And then give them over to their own desires. There's a couple of verses that talk about when you've done all you can do and you're clean, you've allowed God to work in your life, you're in neutral, and you're ready to just open up your heart and say, God, I don't know what you're going to do. Sometimes you have to say, God, if they're going to keep going down that road, I pray for them, but who knows? And so there's an aspect of that that isn't giving up on them, but it is giving it to God for them. But it's, it's way at the end of this list because most of it is about us. You know, you control you, you don't control other people. So the more you can control yourself to be open, honest, neutral, letting God, giving it to God, having God speak to you and challenge you and change you instead of changing this other person, amazing how that leads to a lot more fruit. Uh, let's pray. Lord, uh, we just pray for those that are not here today. Uh, we pray for the health of our congregation, Lord. feels like at some level we are a little bit under attack here physically. And Lord, we just pray that um, you heal us all and uh, bring us through this time that we can rely more on you and less on ourselves. We pray that because you've given us structure for how to get through the tough times in life, the, the moments, the days, the weeks, the months, the years sometimes, Lord, you've given us a path that's, that's amazing, that we can fit into, that we can see your glory, that we can celebrate you instead of ourselves, Lord. We thank you for caring enough about us to set this in motion at the beginning of time. And Lord, we just pray that we can lean into it instead of our own understanding. In Jesus' name, amen.